Welcome, welcome. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. I know it's Cinco de Mayo. I know that there are more fun things that you could possibly be doing, but we are going to have a great time tonight with a ton of good information. So um, we appreciate your attendance tonight. There is, by the way, um, for those of you who are in attendance tonight, I'm going to be giving away free stuff at the end. So um, hang around till the bitter, bitter end, and I will just kind of randomly pick a couple people to win a little bit of SDI swag. Um, that's what you guys get for being here live. So welcome, welcome. Um, my early birds already heard this spiel, but for those of you who came in in the last you know minute or two here, a uh, little housekeeping item. First is the chat section. If you want to talk to each other, the chat section is here for you. Um, pro tip though, if you want everybody to see your comments, you got to toggle from all panelists to all panelists and attendees in your to area, T-O colon, and then it'll say all panelists in your chat section. Change that to all panelists and attendees. Don't know why it defaults to that, but it does. Um, second piece of advice here is if you do have questions for our guests tonight, um, please make sure that you po post those in the Q&A section, not the chat section. Going to be a lot of activity tonight, and I want to make sure that if you do have a question for Petro, um, that I can get to it, and the best way for me to do that is to see it in Q&A. Uh, as you can see, a lot of people in here have already said where they're tuning in from tonight, city and state. Love to hear that. Do me a favor too, so I know who I'm talking to tonight. Let me know if you're a current student, a graduate, not a student yet, former student. Let me know what kind of mix we're dealing with tonight. Um, some of you may even have Mike Petronella as an instructor right now. That would be pretty cool. So, um, without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. I don't know as far as these webinars go, I never know who already knows about SDI, so I try to give a really brief snippet, snippet at the beginning to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So bear with me, I keep them really short, I promise. Um, Sonoran Desert Institute is an online uh, school that focuses specifically on firearms technology, so programs and courses that are specifically related to the firearms industry. Um, we have two main programs, the uh, Associate of Science and Firearms Technology degree program, which is 60 credit hours long, Everything we do is online. Um, we ship all of your tools and resources to you. So just as a disclaimer, we have the degree program and the advanced gunsmithing certificate, 32 credit hours. Um, like I said, both of them are online in delivery. Uh, so you'll do all of your tests, quizzes, reading, watching videos, interacting with other students, interacting with an, your instructors. All of that's in your online classroom. Um, you will have a series of labs that you'll take as a student as well. We ship all of those kits, tools, resources, and materials to you so that you can practice uh, some of those kind of practical application techniques um, based on the things that you're learning in courses. So it's a ton of fun. Um, we enjoy, uh, we're very honored to have a very high uh, military connected student population, honored to be serving those who have served us. Thank you very much. I'm sure a ton of you tonight um, are currently serving or have served. Uh, thank you for your service, and uh, please let us know if we can do anything for you, sdi.edu for more information, or you can email admissions at sdi.edu. That's the whole spiel. I did it. I think we got in there under a minute, so get in, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty right now. Um, first of all, Mike Petronella, thank you for being with us tonight. We have SDI's Associate Dean of Firearms Technology, Mike Petronella. I, you'll hear me call him Petro throughout the evening probably as well, so I may toggle back and forth a little bit, but um, certainly glad that you're here tonight. I'm very excited about this topic. I think everybody else is too. So um, would you mind getting us rolling with a little bit of your background? Kind of catch uh, us up on that. Yeah, no problem. Um, and thanks for spieling out my title because I always get tongue twisted on that. I, you said much better than I can. <laughs> um, so let that painful bandage ripped off right <laughs> off the bat. Um, my name is Mike Petronella. Everybody calls me Petro. It's easier to say, and we have a lot of mics on staff, and there's a lot of mics in the world, so it's just it's simpler that way, and, you know, avoid all confusion. Um, been it with SDI now uh, a little over five years, probably right mm -hmm. on give or take a month or so. Uh, my background started out in law enforcement, uh, 23 years, and you know, enjoy shooting, love, love guns long prior to that, and was fortunate enough uh, during my time at the PD. Uh, I don't want to say weasel my way into position, but, you know, sought out those those spots where, you know, I, I got to work on the range, uh, range master armor, did all the SWAT stuff, worked up SWAT armor. So um, 
I don't want to call it free training, but I got a lot of cool training. Um, got to go to all the armor schools, maintain my search, which was fun at first, but every two or three years retaking the same class to maintain certification over 23 years got really old, but um, it did give me a great baseline knowledge. Um, you know, after, uh, after my PD years, uh, came over to SDI uh, and started out teaching and eventually I, I obviously still am teaching. Um, I will get your papers if you're my current students, I promise. Um, but now I'm doing uh, the associate dean on, on the firearm side of the house. A um, little more admin stuff, but still keeping my feet wet teaching. Um, also, uh, I also work with a company called uh, Bruger and Tomit. Um, it's easier to say B and T. We like initials here in slang. So um, they're a, a Swiss firearms manufacturer uh, specialized in submachine guns. And mainly it's a suppressor company. It's been around 30 plus years. Uh, they're one of the OEM manufacturers for all of uh, HK suppressors, and they was recently won the, well, recently, last year, won the first submachine gun contract for the United States Army since the grease gun in World War II. So um, for them, I handle all of the government sales and also a lot of the commercial sales. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight is, uh, you know, really, hey, I, I've got my FFL. I want to open a gun store or where do I go from there? How do I buy guns to sell? You know, things, topics like that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's get rolling then, if you don't mind. Um, no, no problem. I think that's a great place to start. I've got my FFL. Yep. Uh, I want to open a shop. What now? You know, do you have kind of a, an entry level hit list of what needs to happen next? Well, I'll, I'll hit the high points and uh, mm -hmm. we can, you know, field questions as we go. Yep. Um, you know, uh, most, you know, some of you might be here just, I just want to be a gunsmith. Um, I, I just want to open a gun store. Most gun stores have gunsmiths attached to them. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a combo thing um, just because it's a, it's a steady revenue stream. So you've got, you've got your store opened up. You've got your FFL. Okay. How do I stock guns um, to sell to ultimately make money? I mean, that's what it's about. So um, as a, you know, beginning FFL, the, easiest way what most people start with or businesses start with is they they're going to buy from a distributor um, mainly because distributors are going to hold inventory where if you have a customer come come in i want this gun you're going to log on to that distributor's website uh, and order that gun for them that's great because you don't have to have a lot of capital to i need to fill my store with guns that mm -hmm. that's a lot of financial backing um, so you kind of start small the downside of that is you may not, by the time it passes from the manufacturer to the distributor to you, you're obviously gonna make less money on that transaction. So mm -hmm. you gotta kind of balance the convenience of not having standing inventory versus how much are you gonna make per transaction? Um, so now if you have financial backing, you can go maybe the direct dealer route with whatever manufacturer you choose, mm -hmm. but that's gonna require you buying inventory. Right. Uh, most manufacturers 10, 15, 20 guns at a time uh, to stock your store with. Um, but most people don't start out like that unless they win the lotto and you know want to go hog wild and open a gun Things store. Things are a lot easier in those instances, I'm sure. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to worry about making a profit after that, too. It's just kind of <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's kind of the general overview. And you know, some of the major distributors are RSR, Davidson's, Lipsy's, Sport South. Um, and there's really not one better than the others. They just, some carry different products, uh, some charge a little bit more, a little bit less, some specialties. So it's really just what do you want to specialize in? What's your area of the country? Mm -hmm. Because depending on where you're at in the U.S., not all, there, some guns are more popular than others. You might be in bolt action country. You might be in shotgun country. You might be in black rifle country um, or a combo of both. Um, and you know, a lot of the smaller gun shops, even if you're in some remote part of the country, you may not have a lot of walking crowd, but the smart ones will sell guns online. Mm -hmm. They're going to, they're going to have that web store run open and rolling. Sure. Um, one of the, one of our best dealers that work with us literally runs it out of, out of their basement and they, they move eight to $10 million in product a year out of their basement. So it's a husband and wife team uh, all online. So, um, don't overlook that. That box right. should be checked. Absolutely. Um, can we back up for just a second? Um, yeah. We had somebody ask, is it easier to start with a gunsmith FFL or a dealer FFL? And I don't know 
how deep we want to get into the types, you know what I mean? But any initial thoughts on that kind of thing? Short answer dealer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, I'm, I'm seeing a couple questions here, both in the chat and in the Q and A that have to do Fairly. with like zoning and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I know that there are, it's going to be different everywhere. Um, but do you have any tips and tricks on what they should be thinking about when they're thinking of starting up that business and looking into zoning laws, any resources on that front? Uh, re obviously you, you have to check your local zoning laws because some, some jurisdictions or, or cities areas won't allow you to run a home-based business without a storefront. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking to open a shop in, in your town or a town, uh, if they don't allow that, that that's an automatically a no-go. Um, not going to happen. So right. um, that should be a, the first place you look because um, you'll still get your federal firearms license if you, if you meet all the requirements and they're not going to care, but you may not be able to run your business uh, on, a, on a local level. Um, at least out of your home right what are the other yeah, options yeah. there you know well, um, a, st a storefront yep um but again you're still subject to zoning so um you know less restrictive but you still need to uh just like real estate location 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 or re restaurants i think they call it that um mm -hmm. apply by that sure. but you need a good location for foot traffic and depending on how cities are zoned you they may not want a gun store downtown on main street um yeah. or they may but uh you may not get a prime spot they may shuffle you off in the industrial area somewhere so all that is pre-research before i'd look at that before you even apply for an ffl because that might really dictate what you well it's per you address can't, so, you can't get it yeah. without that yeah. figured yeah. out you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. a good bit of groundwork so cool um and then we do have a question about um Ah, profit margins, but I don't think we're there yet. You know what I mean? I think uh, I want to get a couple steps down the yep. line before we get to profit margins. So. I'll get there. I can ramble on that later. Okay, cool. Uh, um, okay, cool. So what next steps for them as far as figuring out, I know that we've got the options to sell online. I know that we've got the options to go through a dealer. Where does that leave us? Well, uh, probably what should I sell? Um, mm -hmm. And the easy answer everybody mentions is, well, hey, um, I'm going to sell what's popular. That That's a good start. But the popular guns, you may sell a lot of them, but you may not make a lot of money off them. There's a really solid low-end market. And I mean low-end, not by quality. I mean by, by price point. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to use low-end and high-end. So don't attach that to, oh, that's a, that's a junky gun. No, it's sure. just it's lower price point. Um, I'll use high points, for example. High Point is a very successful company, multi-million dollar company. They sell a lot of guns. They dominate the low-end market. Um, the issue with lower-end guns is you make less per transfer. You may only make $10 a profit off a pistol. So how many High Points are you going to have to sell per hour um, right. to, pay, to pay the light bill? Um, if you have that foot traffic and that volume, great, knock yourself out. Same thing with the high-end. You're going to sell less guns, but... Um, you may be making 20 points or 20% margin on a high-end gun, you know, $3,000 rifle, 20, 20 points. If I had, if I could do math on camera, I'd tell you the answer to that, but it's more so than, than, than the lower end guns. The dangerous area um, is the middle ground. And that's where you're, they may not move as much and you're not going to make as much money. And I'll use an example of uh, the AR-15, America's, America's, you know, Black sporting rifle falls mm -hmm. right in that category. Now there are some exceptions where there are higher end ARs and lower end ARs, but the middle ground, if you buy an AR for you know six seven hundred dollars, you're not going to make that much money off of uh, per transfer, and they're everywhere. So yes, you should probably sell some variant of AR, but you need to pick your area wisely because not every economic area is going to want a two thousand dollar rifle versus a one thousand dollar rifle. So, yep. really, how much money you're going to make is going to dictate what type of products you sell. Um, and really, the margins on accessories are a lot better than right. the margins on firearms. So, mm -hmm. you'll get looky loos that may walk into a gun shop and take three or four trips to decide what they want. Well, if you sell them a gun, you're going to sell them extra magazines, ammo, um, 
you know, your sales staff's not doing their job if they're not going to, you know, load up the car with, uh, you need mud flaps and, and, and floor mats too, and assignmentize. Same thing applies to, to selling guns. You're going to want every accessory, optics, you're going to want to try to load it up as much as possible because the margins on accessories, sometimes, depending on what it is, could be 40, 50%. Sure. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, well, 20%. Well, and building that transaction total, yes. you know. Yep. That, that per transaction total is probably really important to long-term maintenance. Well, and even on a low-end gun, let's let's say you you make two bucks on selling one low-end gun, but if you sell them a bunch of ammo with it, that's where you're making your margins and making your profit. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, basically diversify. <laughs> Petro, I'm going to pause us for a second. There is a debate in the chat right now. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about FFLs in general? Um, there's a little bit of a debate on whether or not you need an FFL to not necessarily work on a gun. I think it's been, I think everybody's good that we need an yep. FFL to work on a gun for profit long term. There's been some question though on, hey, I thought I could, if I'm working on it right there on the spot, I thought I didn't have to have it if I didn't have to have it up, you know, the firearm overnight and that kind of thing. Can you give us FFL basics, 101, just put everybody on the same page? Uh, I, I, I will with a disclaimer. I don't hold an FFL um, mm -hmm. and I'm not an ATF attorney. So yep. take that with a grain of salt. We actually do um, have webinars on the FFL process and what what each of those mean as well. So guys, if you go to the YouTube channel and go to the webinars playlist, um, Brandon Maddox from FFL 123 came in, at, you know, two years ago, something like that, and did a really good in-depth look. And then we had an ATF guy, Dan O'Kelly, do another kind of bits and pieces of that type of thing so there's information out there as well but petro if you could kind of just give us the basics that'd be great so, so really in a nutshell the the issue is um the time period um working on it on the spot isn't the issue it's if you take the gun in you have to put it on your books you know take mm -hmm. it in as an overnight so that's where the ffl comes into play but um you know if you're just working on a gun on the spot which is usually pretty rare mm -hmm. <laughs> Sure. Um, you can't be done unless it, it, it's just a, a quick swap out or something. Uh, you you won't need one. But mm -hmm. if you're, it, it doesn't hurt. If you're really going to play in the gunsmith world, just get one. It makes things so much easier. Um, and just, it takes away all the gray areas. And you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. That, that's my, my short non, non-attorney answer. I think that's good. I think that's good to get us all on the same page. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. I think I cut you off right in the middle of, that last topic there but um, yeah i was on a roll with something uh sorry. margins um margins yes we'll, yeah we'll, we'll start circle back and, and transaction goes. totals you know kind of yep. running that the business from that from that yep vantage point um generally uh, i was kind of shocked because um uh, when i was on the uh, the pd i was in charge of you know procuring weapons you know buying and testing and all that stuff and um, you know, obviously government pricing is, is better than commercial pricing, but I never understood, okay, let's say a gun's a thousand dollars that I didn't have anything to relate it to, but generally the manufacturer, you're looking at least 50% markup off the bat, uh, on that gun. So let's say it's a thousand bucks. It costs that manufacturer roughly five, 500 bucks to make it. Mm -hmm. Now you've got 50 points to play with goes from the manufacturer. Um, to a distributor well distributor is going to take 20 uh, maybe 20 30 points off that then it goes to a dealer now the dealer's left with you know 20 points to play with so really by the time it gets to the gun shop you've only got a 20 percent profit margin to start with and you're only allowed to play with pricing so much because there's map pricing minimum advertised price where yep. um you can't go below that. If, well, you can, but you'll get in trouble if the, if the manufacturer finds out about it and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll cut you off. So you can see where the, the bulk of the money is made by the manufacturers. Um, they're going to get their 50% profit right off the bat. And sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending on where the brand's located. Mm -hmm. um, so the more hands it passes through, uh, the less there is for the end gun shop to play with. Um, where if you are a direct dealer, you bypass distribution um, and able to direct, you have more margins to play with. Now, the prices you'll pay if you go direct with a manufacturer 
you're not going to have the same pricing list as a distributor because distributors buy hundreds of guns at a time. They get better pricing. You know, it's the Costco principle. You buy more toilet paper, it costs less yep. um, as opposed to one roll at a time. Um, but those margins also apply again for, for accessories and generally accessories, you, there's a lot more margin to play with because there's not as intensive manufacturing involved to make uh, a plastic grip, you know, Magpul P mags or a, a polymer magazine. Mm -hmm. That's all of uh, a buck something in plastic and metal and, and sure. that's it. But by the time it hits the end, the end consumer, they're eight ninety nine, ten ninety nine. So you can see the tremendous markup in polymer products um, compared to a gun. Right. Um, so there's quite a few questions here that are talking about competition. How do we play the game, basically? How do you compete as a small business owner with a big box store? Or how, you know, we've got these, you know, gun de larger gun dealers, um, Jim says, or uh, medium gun dealers, all with a presence online. These are kind of some of those volume plays, yep. those, those distributors you were just talking about. How would people like the people watching this webinar kind of hope to compete in that environment give them some tips and tricks maybe or what what would the strategy be there well it, it's it's vague and foggy at best but i'll i'll, I'll do my best sure. to clear it up um and there's no lightning in a bottle you know what i mean there there's is no a, one um, way to do any of this but yeah if, if i had the secret i'd be on a book tour right now exactly oh, and uh, <laughs> in a barnes and noble sitting sitting behind a desk but yeah. i don't have that scene uh generally it's um you're not going to you're not going to be able to compete with them buying power. Just sure. again, it's not going to happen. So that's where picking your products really matters. Um, finding that niche that the big ones will overlook because not that they didn't see it, because it's not worth their time to to divert to. They're they're looking at volume. Where can I make the most money and dump my thousands of guns? Uh, you know, a month to what dealers? Mm -hmm. So you need to find the products that are right for your area that the big boys maybe not ha have seen or care with uh, or, or care with care about yep. um, they haven't hit the, the manufacturers that haven't hit the big time yet but are a thing and that comes into predicting what is the next thing um, you know I saw it with the AR market back in 08 um, once the laws uh, loosened up everybody and their brothers I'm gonna make an AR right well that that's great for about the first 10 or 15 companies after that you're late to the game um and most of those companies didn't survive two to three years sure. um it's happening now with the glock market the aftermarket glock everybody's got their their version of a striker fired gun um it's going to go the same way as the ar-15 now the people that were on that trend early man they've they've made their money um and it's great so what's the next trend i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you're not um, a futurist well, petro that's not no no I, I try and i've been wrong every time <laughs> i can't pull the karnak and figure things out mm -hmm. that, that showed my age right there some of you will get it <laughs> um bolt guns big resurgence in uh, uh bolt guns uh last few years um shotguns never really went away they were always big uh hunting mm -hmm. the whole tactical side and i hate that word tactical sure um, is a fraction of the firearms market. I mean, it's a it, minor statistic. Mm -hmm. The bulk of the guns sold in the US are bolt action rifles and shotguns. Um, and then black rifles are, are in there too. But all yeah. the tactical stuff is is minor when you look at the industry as a whole. Yep. Um, same thing with long guns versus pistols. Pistols far outweigh um, numbers wise units sold versus long guns. Mm -hmm. So Okay, cool. That was kind of a non-answer, but that's, you, you just got to find a niche that the big though. boys aren't covering. Yeah, and, and some of this has to do, I, I hear the concept of maybe finding a niche um, and and focusing on that kind of thing. There have been a couple questions in here that ask about that. You know, how do you figure that out? How do you, uh, how do you, okay, I'm just going to specialize in something. Well, what is that something? How do you get to that point? Is that, is there a market research component to that? Is there a follow your gut kind of deal? How do you know as a new business owner, those, those types of things? You, you got to do the market research. Um, and usually if it's hit the internet, it's already old. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, if you, if you see an emerging trend on the internet, it's already, it's already been planned out behind mm -hmm. the scenes and you're late to the game already. Um, you got to do the research. Um, and 
open research is kind of difficult. So uh, sure. get the yeah, next go, gun industry, right? There's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's um, got to be a tough one. Um, get get the shot show uh, if you can and mm -hmm. do your research there. Um, yep. Again, that's going to require an FFL or, or an invite, but uh, that's the best way to do it. Then you can actually talk to the manufacturers and hey, what do you got? What are you releasing next year? What's you know, what's a dealer program and actually go, go face to face and, and figure out, read the tea leaves, what's going to work best for me in my area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A um, couple, uh, you know, past webinars that we've had, I saw Kip Carpenter is here live and in the chat tonight, guys. Oh, I, no. I saw him sneak in. I hope um, you didn't ask me any gunsmithing questions. He I'll, hasn't I'll yet. So. <laughs> He's not putting you on the spot yet, but we All did right. a, a webinar with Kip last month um, who kind of talked about, the gunsmithing part of this, you know, so I feel like Petra, what you're talking about right now and what we talked about with Kip last month are really marrying together well, because um, from a gunsmithing perspective, Kip kind of says, hey, do it all at first and then figure out, you know what I mean, what you're really good at or what people want, you know, a lot of or that, that kind of thing. So that really echoes what you're talking about here is um, figure out what people want and really, really double down on that kind of thing. Um, Question here about, it seems like a couple people are trying to say the same type of thing. So um, Scott has been researching distributors so that he can sell accessories online. Um, finding it hard to find a distributor that doesn't like require a brick and mortar store. And then somebody else kind of asks, can I just be a dealer? And like, how do I get in with these people? You know, any navigation tips on that front? Good, good point that I overlooked about uh, some distributors have requirements. They, uh, a couple of my distributors uh, don't want to deal with suppressors. Mm -hmm. um, huge market left, but that's, that's their business. Soon. Some sure. don't, you have to have a brick and mortar store to do it. Some don't care. Um, get, again, you have to research and, and ask, Hey, what are your requirements? What's your minimum requirements for being a dealer um, or to, for, you know, joining, buying from your distribution network. Um, and one thing I overlooked, there's, uh, other than direct dealer distributors, there's something called buy groups. Um, and what that is, it's, they're basically, uh, buying cooperatives or, or co-ops, so to speak, two of the major ones are NBS and Sports Inc. And what that is, is, you know, a, a bunch of quote, small gun dealers apply, become members of these buying co-ops and they are treated uh, as a whole as distributors. So they can, these smaller gun dealers can buy with, have the same buying power as a distributor, Neat. get the same pricing, same buying power. There are membership requirements to these buy groups. Um, some of them require, you know, some you know, one to $2 million a year in revenue. They want some proven business. They just don't let, they're selective. They don't let anybody in. Um, if it's your first month of running, I, I'm gun store Joe and I opened last month, you aren't going to get into that. Sure. They're going to want to see a couple of your track records. So that's a good next logical step after, you know, maybe start with distributors, uh, buy from them, lose some margins and then build your business up to get into a buy group. And then you've got the same buying power. That's how you compete with the big boys. Yeah. And I can't believe I forgot that when that question was asked, but that's how you do it. Um, it kind of evens the playing field. Nice. And they get phenomenal deals and, uh, they also get terms. Uh, one thing I didn't cover, uh, direct dealers, uh, depending on the manufacturer, you can get uh, uh, either no terms, meaning you pay for the guns and we ship them to you, or 30-day uh, you know, terms, 60-day terms, and buy groups automatically get better terms, you know, 30, 60 days. So if you're smart uh, as a gun dealer in these groups, you'll order the product, well, hopefully it's not sitting in your shelf for more than 30 days and you're turning a profit before that bill for the guns even comes in. So product right. turnover is also key to keeping the wheel rolling. You don't want mm -hmm. dead stuff. If a gun sits on a shelf more than a, a few days, it's, you're losing money on it. Mm -hmm. uh, think of a car dealer. You got to turn that lot over as fast as you can. Um, and that applies to all the products. So that's how you're going to get your money before, you know, basically it's a free loan. You don't have to have that money up front. If you get the machine rolling, you're just, you're paying off the invoices off. Uh, it's already money in your pocket before the bill comes. Awesome. Um, any idea what ammo margins are or what to expect if somebody's starting to get into that? Um, I, I don't offhand. I do know they are tighter than gun margins and, and they, uh, 
they have fluctuated. Uh, prices are generally down. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the ammo company companies have been suffering um, recently uh, just because the margins got really thin because they had to compete. Uh, the market always writes itself. Ammo prices will go back up. Sure. Um, sure. Just like gun prices, they go up and down, but um, you won't make as much uh, on ammo um, mm -hmm. because mainly because the internet. Um, they can always find a better deal. Well, I, I can save 50 cents a box. I can just go online and have it shipped to my house. So if you're going to play in the ammo game, make sure you do it on the internet. And again, you got to buy in bulk um, to get yep. the better pricing like anything else. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. A um, couple questions here on specific types of things that people want to sell. So um, what's the process for distributing surplus rifles? Any insight on any of that? Well, um, Good luck finding them. First of all, first of all, the, the heyday of the surplus. Um, that that was back in my day where you could actually find true surplus rifles. Um, they've dry, the the good stuff is pretty much dried up. Um, they're still scavenging Eastern Europe for some remaining pieces, but again, most of that is brought in, you know, by uh, uh, distributors. And then you'll see Atlantic Arms is is a good one. They'll they'll they get some uh, Eastern European finds and surplus uh, police stuff in um, quite a bit, mm -hmm. but you're, unless you want to import them yourselves, which is a whole different, it requires a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of licensing, a lot of hassle. Sure. Um, you're probably going to be stuck buying from one of the import distributors and the selection from what it used to be is just, is, is not, you're not going to find the crate of Mosin the Gantz for, uh, you know, for a hundred bucks a piece anymore. Those sure. or 30 bucks a piece. Those days are gone. So be a good day though <laughs> yes yeah if, if you can great don't hold your breath <laughs> right right um how about the plan to buy low upgrade and then sell thoughts on that um well um it, it doesn't hurt because again if you accessorize the rifle up it, it's different well you should buy this buy this look it's hanging on a shelf but if you put it together as a package um you may break even on the gun, but make money on, on the accessories that are on there. Um, it's an easier sell. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll use a pistol brace, for example. Um, yeah, you can sell an AR pistol without a brace on it. Um, but if you include the brace, it helps it helps it sell and you make margins on the brace. Um, so yeah, that that is, just don't overdo it because then you, you gotta play with the price. If you really overdo it and it looks like it's got mud, uh, you know, curb feelers hanging off both sides of the rifle and it's bright colors and every accessory, time you total it up, that, that could create some sticker shock. So there's a happy medium to be had. Sure, definitely. Um, and I had a follow-up question on ammo. Uh, where is there licensing for selling ammo? Yes. Um, and I, I don't know the type off by hand, but yes, there are um, their shipping requirements or storage requirements. Yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's get back into it then. Um, we kind of talked about margins. We talked about um, finding something to specialize in. Uh, yeah. we, we haven't really talked about, and there have been a couple questions on things like insuring your business. Do you have any insights on that kind of thing or what anything from that administration? side that people should be thinking about when they're first getting into business or doing anything on that front? Um, not personally, but uh, insurance is a thing. It's a cost mm -hmm. it's, and it's, um, you know, I can't quote rates off the top of my head, but you need it. Um, mm -hmm. um, not just for property loss, but liability insurance um, because the, we're in a litigious society. People will go deep pocket. Uh, they'll sue this gun store where they got it from. Then they'll go after the manufacturer. And the, everybody that touched that gun to the consumer's hand is going to get potentially sued. So you, yep. you absolutely need it. Very nice. And I know that um, in, in past webinars, I think we've told people to kind of start with, um, you know, NRA insurance, just blanket NRA insurance type of deal. Like look at the NRA first and then look for local firearm specific insurance companies. They do exist. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you can't even find a local one, a lot of times if you type in your state, for example, 
that's a that's a good way to do it too. So um, I know that there were kind of a couple questions on that. It's so difficult to discuss things like insurance without being the insurance guy, you know? Yeah, um, and, and no no one likes to talk to an insurance guy, but you, you kind of have to because it's important. Right. Um, and, you know, one thing you know, on the insurance front it got me thinking, um, you know, on, on top of the, the insurance, you're also going to need um, – God, and I lost my train of thought. It's gone. It'll come back. That's Let's okay. I'm sure we'll be right. We'll be right <laughs> in the middle of something I had a great idea and it's just right into the cornfield. Yep. Um, how about any idea how that plays in with a couple people are asking about business insurance versus homeowners insurance. And again, I think I would just probably yeah, direct I, people to the insurance folks, yep. right? Okay. Um, so let's keep it more business related from an ops perspective. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to talk through in regards to managing a sa like the sales of things or you know what I mean making sure that yeah. the, the back end of things is running smoothly and I just remember what I was going to talk about with Perfect. my great idea that came back um you know point of sale um you're mm -hmm. going to have to uh make sure you know if you take credit cards the credit card processing company is gun friendly yep. there are gun friendly ones and there are not gun friendly ones yep. same with your bank uh, same with your website host. Um, you know, the Shopify is anti-gun. Um, yep. You can't list firearms and accessories on Shopify. Um, Big Commerce is gun friendly. Um, so you, there's, you really got to do your research on every level of it um, mm -hmm. to begin with. So, I think that was actually a, a question down here um, pertaining to. So we know that Facebook, for example. Mm -hmm. is, yep anti-gun um yep. from a from an advertising perspective now there yep. can you know coming from that world i will say there are ways that you can work around that kind of thing but straight up selling firearms on facebook obviously yep. puts you in facebook jail so um are there sites or gun friendly advertising online types of uh setups that you would recommend looking into uh, well that dives down into the whole social media um route which yep. you know you, you can speak to better better than than me but uh sure. you, you I mean, short of you got to get the word out at every possible channel to draw attention to your business uh, yep. however that is do it um you know i, I wouldn't take a print ad out in a local paper those don't do so well nowadays but mm -hmm. uh, you gotta get the word out definitely okay great um hold on let me scroll through the, I, I just had a couple of them pop through here uh, any suggestions or recommend recommendations about gun layaway and or financing? So we talked a little bit about term, I mean, you know, how, I mean, this is a little bit of a different concept though. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're almost kind of going down the pawn shoppy route, which mm -hmm. I mean, um, you can do it. Um, at the end of the day, is it worth your time? Um, I don't know many gun shops that will do layaways. Um, they exist. But um, the one the ones I've dealt with don't because it's not worth their time to do. Um, but again, if you're in an area where it's big, by all means, why not? Um, as long as at the end of the day, as long as it's worth your time, i.e., money, um, then yeah, absolutely explore it. Okay. Um, reloading. Any thoughts on looking into doing that for other people? Is it worth it? Okay, same same type of thing. Uh, liability, liability, liability. Mm -hmm. Carry your insurance um, if you're going to do it you you need to do it at a if you're going to do it and sell it you need to do it at a professional level and yeah. be ready for liability um yeah, potential problems so if you're going to get in the ammo business do it 100 percent and get in the ammo business if not you probably shouldn't okay that's that's good advice for sure um to circle back around to some of the processing items any good and kevin correct me if i'm not asking this correct this question correctly but kevin wood says any good um CC deals, which I think is credit card, uh, that work with firearms. Any reliable companies, general fees to expect? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, and, mm -hmm. and don't take that as there aren't any out there. I just, I don't know. Okay. Um, okay, cool. My, most most, most uh, fees are, you know, 3 to 4%. Um, your general, they're your general credit card fees, whether they're gun friendly or not. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, what else? Uh, let me go down my crib sheet here and make sure. Um, we kind of hopped all the way all around. I'm sure I threw you off a little bit here. But. Yeah, I'm, th I'm throwing dart, darts at a board here. Um, it's a big topic. Yeah. 
Um, I could throw another another level to it with uh, uh, foreign made guns, um, you know, overseas. Uh, yep. I'll, I'll talk about Europe because that's kind of what I know about. Um, the margins get even worse. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> because now the, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. arm of the company is paying, um, you know, I'll use for an example, um, you know, if we buy guns, we have to pay Switzerland for the guns. So you're already whittling down margins even more before it even hits the U.S. shore. And then you start adding on a distributor, dealer, and all that stuff. So an imported gun for made, you may, at the end of the day, instead of playing with, you know, 15 to 20% margin on a dealer, and you might be down to 5 to 10 so again, that's where picking the product, that might be a hot brand, but how many are you going to have to sell and at what price point? Mm -hmm. But fortunately, most foreign made guns demand a higher price point. So if you eat 5% margin, you're still making several hundred dollars per transfer uh, or, or per sale. So something else to look at. Okay, great. Um, how much do you know about or how much do we want to talk about? Uh, we've had a couple people ask about sole proprietorships versus LLCs, um, that kind of structure of your business. Do you have any recommendation? I, I, I don't, uh, just yeah. be, it's, it's not my area. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've seen them done both ways, but I, I can't speak to which one's better or why. Um, sure. That'd be a good attorney question. Definitely. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk, do you have any Thing that you want to talk about as far as um, marketing or advertising? There have been a couple questions about that type of thing. Um, yeah, I can touch on that. Um, uh, marketing and advertising is tricky because it can be a huge um, money vacuum mm -hmm. and it's really hard to track return on investment. Um, most of your gun, I'll use gun magazines as an example. I won't mention mm -hmm. any names, but they're all generally the same. Um, most of the articles you see in them, um, we call them advertorials. Um, they're not true reviews. They're, sure. you know, very slant, slanted, craftily written advertisements. Super positive write-ups, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, name the last time you've seen a negative write-up in a gun magazine. Right. That should answer your question. So, and with those articles, you'll conveniently see several pages of advertising from the gun they just talked about, wacky. Um, they're ad driven, which hey, and I'm not knocking that. They, that's how the business is. They got mm -hmm. they have to pay their employees and yep. turn a profit and sell sell magazines. Um, but just because in a, a a full page ad and you know a a, a major magazine um, that I won't mention uh, could run you twenty thirty thousand dollars for yeah. a, for a, a two page ad. Um, that's not uncommon. That's why you see the the, the bigger manufacturers will throw, you know, what seems like a lot of cash to normal mortals, that's disposable income for them. They'll, they'll throw a hundred grand at a, at a magazine for a month in, in, you know, glossies. Now the question is, do they get a return on investment? Do you see a bump in sales because, oh, my, my, this brand was in a magazine and did a big great write up. And of course it worked perfectly flawlessly every time. Mm -hmm. um, did we see a bump in sales? Maybe, maybe not. If you saw a bump in sales, it, can you prove it to that? because right. you ran an ad on it. There's no way. So that's even more murky reading tea leaves, but um, you just gotta be real cautious because it, it can get expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying it doesn't work, not saying it works. I, I just, you don't know. Um, I, my caveat there would be that make sure you understand tracking. You know what I mean? Before yeah. you make the decision to spend money on an advertisement, because there are ways to tie back that ROI, but not until you figure it out for, you know what I mean? You have to lay yep. that groundwork first um, to make sure that you have ways well, to earmark that. Really print, I don't want to say print's dead, but it, it's dying. Mm -hmm. um, it'll hang on for several more years sure. and who knows what's going to morph into, but yep. um, online is the way to go. Banner ads, uh, yep. pick your high traffic websites, do your banner ads, and you can get click-through rates from those banner ads and mm -hmm. get your and you have some kind of ROI. Hey, at least somebody looked at this. I know how many people looked at it. You'll never know how many people looked at it and bought something yep. unless you have a specific coupon code for that site. Mm -hmm. Hey, code 1234 gets you 10% off. Yep. That's absolute tracking. Um, so it's just some different tools you, you can use to judge. But also banner ads are significantly less expensive. 
Definitely. Cause it's a volume yeah. play. It's it you're paying for the number of eyes that are going to be yeah. on the internet. So for sure. Um, how about, uh, I've seen a couple people talk a little bit about the networking side of things. Um, and getting in good with other local businesses. Any talking points on that that you want to get into? Um, I'll, I'll take local businesses to mean other firearms uh, manufacturers, suppliers. Um, it may seem like a big industry. Um, it isn't. Uh, this this last shot show is my I think my shot show number twenty. Um, it's not being fun about number two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, uh, it it's definitely networking and it is a small industry and word of mouth is very important. Word of mouth travels even faster than the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so, and word of mouth can be good or bad depending on your reputation, but also uh, it could allow you to pick up a phone. Hey, I know a guy over here. Hey, who do you, who are you getting your barrels from? Who's, who's supplying your barrel blanks? I need mm -hmm. a barrel supplier. My guy just went out of business. Um, so networking is absolutely key and it just, there's no quick way to build a network. It just takes time and talking to people, making friends and making business acquaintances and moving, moving on from there. Yep, absolutely. And I would take that one step further. If you are going to be one of the organizations that has a website, for example, um, word of mouth is super duper important. And it's also very important from a review perspective, you know, I think people, there's a bunch of stats out now that talk about um, people looking in 12 different places for um, other people's reviews or opinions on something before they make a purchase. So um, that's where I think the digital space does have a play in word of mouth is in those it, review type sites. It, it's the Yelp factor is what it is. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, I will throw a caveat on reviews. Um, human nature being what it is, most people don't take the time to write a great review. Right. Uh, some do and great, but you're going to, when you see negatives, people are more, well, they're angry. That's where they're, angry. they're more likely to For put sure. a negative review versus you may see 10 good reviews and five negatives. Well, that 10 re good reviews might be several hundred. It's just, they never took the time to do it because they don't, they don't care. They're happy. They're satisfied. So take it, take the negative stuff with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, had an interesting one come in optics and thermal or night vision seem to be more available and getting cheaper. Is that worth getting involved with in your opinion? Oh, optics. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. I should have wrote that down on my, on my cribbly, uh, crib, crib sheet here. Um, optics, uh, reason they're getting cheaper the, the, over the last year or two, there's been a lot more optics companies that have just come out of the woodwork. Um, different brands this this most of the, uh, the the price dive and the variation of brands if you look at them they all kind of look generally the same mm -hmm. it's because they're coming from the same factory overseas and all they do is they're buying from the same source rebranding them uh to different quality levels and i'm not saying anything overseas is is horrible there are some good i mean they make iphones overseas iphone's not bad it's just there's different quality levels depending on where they're sourcing it from but mm -hmm. the optic market in general is very crowded um so uh you're back to picking picking a solid brand with a solid reputation of what sells um and that low end high end applies with optics too um you're going to make great margins off a of schmidt bender but not many people are going to buy a five thousand dollar scope so again you need to support your market um you know you want to buy the low the low and you know sub 100 dollars red dots and you have the market to support it great you may make five bucks a piece on them but if you sell a lot it really doesn't matter at the end of the day sure yeah absolutely um i have two questions that i love that just came in uh oh well they're just really kind of ooh, that's a good one um <laughs> Are the margins on services comparable to accessory sales? I love that question. On, on what? Services? On services. Services. So, oh. Yeah. Um, apples and oranges. You know what I mean? Uh, this is two totally different theories and strategies. Um, um, I, I don't know. for That would have been a great uh, uh, question for Kip because mm. gunsmithing is a service. Sure. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the margins of services are services. I can't talk tonight. Are are greater um, just because you're paying for labor. You're paying for someone's time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
as opposed to a, a prepackaged product, uh, you know, a dime a dozen type thing. So uh, mm -hmm. anytime you have a, a personal service of any sort, gunsmithing or otherwise, you're going to pay more for that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it, I think it's yeah. a great. I think a lot of people that are on tonight um, are either students or grads or are thinking of doing this as a Smith shop combo type of deal. So that's such a great um, component of this of this mix for you guys, you know, is to be able to do both of those things. Well, um, the successful yeah. shops do both um, because they're, if a customer walks in, you want to be able to give every service you can to them. They want to buy, buy, buy a firearm. They want to buy accessory. They want to buy a scope. Uh, oh, and they can need your gun worked on. Um, yep. You want to be able to do, ideally do as many of those, check as many of those boxes as possible mm -hmm. um, to, you know, sell or, or make, make, make your money off a of service. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, this is another interesting one. Uh, in okay. your opinion, is a range pro shop a better start than a freestanding storefront? Um, and then there's a second question too, totally different. So I'm gonna let you figure out which one you wanna do first. Um, what about bidding on local law enforcement, like ammo contracts or contracts in general? Does it work? What's it like? That kind of okay, I'll go one and two. Um, okay. Uh, gun stores with ranges, um, they print money. Um, they, they do. Um, the, the thing is, obviously, over overhead's an issue, and That's initial sure, sure. investment is a, is massive. But the yep. ones that have a range where, with a gun shop attached, which is most of them, um, they'll get. Most companies have range programs where they'll buy the range guns at a lower cost because they're mm -hmm. going to get shot and you know ultimately probably destroyed because they they shoot them until they they break and can't be fixed anymore and then mm -hmm. they throw them away or destroy them per atf regulations not throw them away um but right. uh even if they pay full price for the gun every time it's shot they're selling ammunition and it's always nice to test drive the car before you buy it so yeah. you always want to have the rental guns match what you have for sale um, cause that Definitely. will help drive sales. Yep. A absolutely. So you'll be making, making normal, uh, money off the retail side, just, just as a range, but Hey, maybe I want to buy that gun. I just shot. I really like it. Great. Now you can go cross counter and buy it. So yes, but again, it's a, it's a financial hurdle up front. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then so the LMS ammo, back. um, yes, if you can get them, um, yeah. The problem with LE contracts is you're competing with the big boys, um, where most of them require you know a name brand, Winchester Federal, uh, you name it. Um, and the way they have their distributor uh, dealer district, they really don't have dealers. They have distribution network set up where they have territories where um, the local PD might need a bunch of uh, you know new, fe new ten thousand rounds or a hundred thousand rounds of federal ammunition. Well you aren't going to be able to bid on it because federal is going to be swooping in on that contract for you. Um, you may not have a shot. Now, smaller agencies that are, that are less codified with their buying structure. Absolutely. Um, it's great if you can get them because it's, it's a consumable item. They're always going to need more bullets. Whereas if you sell them guns, they may need guns. You buy, sell them guns. They're good for 10 years, sometimes longer mm -hmm. bullets. They need them every year. Um, so yes, if you can get them, but don't get your hopes up just because, um, the big contracts, uh, will get taken direct by the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we only have a couple minutes here. Do you have any big topics on your sheet that we should get to, or do you want me to keep? No, keep, keep, I think I hit okay. them all, uh, plug away and see how many questions we can knock out. Cool. Um, what do you think the primary business should be firearm sales or gunsmithing services? Ooh. Mm. I bet this would, I bet if we had Kip Carpenter on here, you well, guys would have two different answers. Well, yeah, that's right. And, and, and this is for Kip. I'm going to say firearm sales. Um, <laughs> okay. Because how many people want to buy a gun or versus how many people want to fix it, get a gun fixed? Sure. Sure, sure, um, sure. Just, just, I'm, I'm going law averages. No offense, Kip. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, what advice would you have for opening a shop focused on building custom firearms, like a precision long gun, for example? Um, again, you got to research your market, how many customers in your area, because that kind of takes out, as soon as you go down the customer route, it kind of limits your internet ability. Um, people that like custom guns like 
to walk into a place and have a custom gun built. Well, how many people in your area are going to want to do that? Um, if you have that, that need, great. Um, again, that's where you combine, you're not just putting parts together, you're, you're customizing, you're dipping into gunsmithing. Mm -hmm. um, you're charging not only for the gun, but you're charging for the service. So now you're, you're doubling up on your margins. Yep. Um, so yes, if your area will support it, but also that is a whole nother area of, you got to build your reputation. And this is, you know, I'm sure Kip spoke, spoke about this. You got to build your reputation as a customizer in whatever, or a precision, you want to build precision rifles. Yep it takes time to build yes this guy is good here's my secret guy go to him um buy your rifle and he'll trick it out however you want and yes yeah. it's, so um yes if you can cool um how about used guns using your gunsmithing knowledge to potentially towards a better profit margin that kind of thing is there a play there um you used guns are no different than new guns other than spelling um how much can you make off them how quick can you move them if, if they're functional and used, okay, great. You bought it in a state sale or, or you know, uh, anywhere else. How, how much margins can you make off of it? There, there's not a set value. Um, uh, you know, then you, if they're used, so there's always that collector, uh, potential collector value to it if it's somewhat rare or not made anymore. So, mm -hmm. yeah, as long as you can make your margins off it, you, you could make more than buying a new gun and selling it. Cool. Um, who do I go to, to check the serial numbers on a firearm that I think might be stolen? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, call, uh, okay. Uh, call the local police, uh, call the ATF. Um, yep. yeah, you'll have all the contact numbers with, with your FFL. Just go, Hey, I think this gun might be stolen. Um, yeah. Cool. Phone call uh, away. Oh, here's a uh, totally just a random off topic one from Jacob. Okay. What variant of the C96 is up on your wall right now? Um, it's it's the variant uh, replica. Uh, it's a replica variant. It's not real. Um, I wish I had an original one, but uh, it, Ooh, it's, do you have yeah. a fun prop for us tonight? I have a real prop if you want to see it real quick. Yeah, I want to see it. Okay. All right. I almost forgot about it. we got rolling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is the APC 9K. Note that it's, you know, unloaded. No ammo in here. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, closest commercial variant of the new Army submachine gun. Neat. So, nice and compact. Color be stock, and it has the uh, the fun switch on it. So, this is uh, they wanted it small for uh, close protection detail, replacing yeah. your MP 5Ks. So. Neat. <laughs> Darren said, is that the giveaway gun for the night? You wish, uh, you wish. <laughs> Hope you yeah. like the t-shirt. So. Yeah, if if I gave this away, I might be in federal prison for a while. So uh, no. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Let me scroll through things. Um, how would you know if you are working on a gun that's illegal? Well, it, it goes back to uh, you know, finding your previous webinars, but um, you, mm -hmm. you need to research the gun laws, know that, okay, well, this, this trigger doesn't reset. Um, this might be a full auto modification. Serial yeah. numbers are round off. The barrel's cut too short. You need to know the basic firearm uh, rules and regs. Um, yeah, check out that Dan O'Kelly one, guys, the webinar with, um, it, it was it was probably a couple years ago, um, but somebody mentioned in here that he owns and operates gunlearn.com. Great program. Yep. Um, check that one out. He goes over a lot of firearms classification stuff, which is probably a really good, you know, basis for a starting point, at least for kind of understanding some of that. Okay. And you need to know that because that that will trip you up. I mean, uh, you know, uh, administratively and legally. So mm -hmm. that that's yeah. Yep. And uh, Daniel Ramsey, I'd have to look and see when it happened, but I believe it's called um, Firearms Classification, featuring Dan O'Kelly of either Gun Learn or Firearms Certification. Uh, there's a big long <laughs> certification that you get at the end of Gun Learn. Um, so it, look for the name Dan O'Kelly in our, when you go to the YouTube channel, there's a playlist of webinars. Check it, check that out. Um, okay. And then, okay, let's do this one because it is a little more online salesy. I, uh, I gunsmith from my, my home in my basement. Okay. 
Um, it's a walkout basement and I want to start selling firearms online. What is involved in online sales that we haven't talked about? I mean, I know that we have talked about yeah. things tonight when you don't have a space for a retail store and is there like a minimum purchase or anything like that? Uh, a different angle there. Uh, not really. I mean, with, without minimum purchase, you're probably going to buy from a distributor. Mm -hmm. um, they'll ship it to your FFL, which is your, your basement, which is okay. Yep. And then when you make the sale, um, you'll ship it to the receiving FFL. Um, obviously you can't ship a gun to uh, a non FFL holder, um, mm -hmm. especially dealing with, you know, cross state lines and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a successful model. Like I said, the, the one example I gave, they, they multi-million dollars a year out of the basement in product. Um, and they do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, online, a lot of gun dealers, well, they'll, they even have storefronts. They'll still sell on gun broker. They'll have their electronic storefront on gun broker. Why not? Um, that, yeah, it's very successful. Very cool. Awesome. Any final wrap up points or topics that we have missed tonight? that you can think of, Petro? Uh, no, but I'll think of some as soon as we hang up. But I'm sure. Right now, yeah, right Yeah, right now, no. We'll have you back on at some <laughs> yep. point. Part, part two, you know, if there's any the topics I missed, there's, a, there's always potential for part two. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So um, we're in the wrap up zone. Thank you, we have 165 people still on here. Great job, everyone. I'm gonna give away some SDI swag. Uh, I can't remember how I did, we, we did it for the first time live last month, so I can't remember exactly how we rolled through it, but let me do this. Anybody who wants to be entered into this drawing, and I'm just going to scroll through and pick a couple names, um, chime into the chat section and um, tell me a topic that you would like us to look into as far as a webinar, future webinar, you know, so think of something that you are interested in that you would want us to maybe delve into in a future webinar. So if you wanna enter, do that. Give me like 30 seconds. Um, you may have to just deal with me here while I get a couple. There's one. Okay. Oh my gosh, they're going so fast. Yeah, they're, they're, they're coming in. Okay, I'm gonna give everybody about 15 more seconds. A lot of Cerakote I see. Mm -hmm. Applying for FFL, Cerakote stippling. Stippling's a good one. Cool. Okay, three, two, one. All right, I have four people. Here's what I need you to do. If I say your name, I need you to email marketing at sdi.edu. So again, marketing at sdi.edu, and I need your t-shirt size, your mailing address, and your phone number. T-shirt size, mailing address, phone number. Um, we'll have your email address as well, so you'll get an email when the shipment goes out, but um, t-shirt size, mailing address, phone number, email it to marketing at sdi.edu. I have Justin McCoy, last name M-C-C-O-Y, Justin McCoy, J-U-S-T-E-N, I believe. I've got Connor Burgess is number two. So Justin McCoy, Connor Burgess, Nicholas Simpson, and Michael Dunn. Justin McCoy, Connor Burgess, Nicholas Simpson, Michael Dunn. Um, if you guys heard your name, congratulations. You are one of our four lucky winners for this evening. Again, email marketing at sdi.edu, t-shirt size, uh, mailing address, phone number. Okay, so that's it for us tonight. Thank you so much, Petro. I really appreciate it. I think uh, I think we were able to cover a lot of ground tonight. So um, if you guys have feedback for us or want us to dig deeper into any of the things that we talked about, please feel free again. Marketing at sdi.edu is a great place to send that, um, you know, those, those feedback points or any suggestions that you might have. Um, again, if you have questions at, on SDI, uh, SDI in general, you can go sdi.edu. Um, and we hope everybody has a wonderful Cinco de Mayo. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us tonight. We really appreciate you guys being in here until the bitter, bitter end. And Petro, again, thank you so much for your time. Hope you have a great Thanks day. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Everybody have a good night. See you later. Hey guys, Jennifer here. Hope you enjoyed tonight's webinar. We certainly enjoyed putting it on. 
If you like that content, go ahead and click subscribe and leave us a comment if you have any suggestions for what we should be talking about in the future. Also, all of our previous webinars can be found on our YouTube channel in our playlist called SDI Webinars, so check them out. Thanks so much, and we will hope to see you at a future one.